you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's an honor to be here. I want to thank the co-moderators, Alex Nagel and Alphonse Palm, for inviting me. I'm going to give you a uh, where's the state of the art with what they called vagal implants, but we're going to call neuromodulation. Here are my disclosures. Enteromedics is one that may be uh, considered an issue because uh, it is part of this talk, but the others are not. So neuromodulation involves the application of a patterned electrical uh, current to some target organ on the GI tract, whether it's the stomach, the esophagus, the duodenum, the vagus nerves, etc. And the idea is to either augment in the case or stimulate certain physiologic responses or do the opposite, block certain physiologic responses. The technology is not new. It's been around over 10 years. Uh, the original work was done in the late 90s, and it's still a work in progress. We ain't there yet. So let me sort of go through where we are. And once again, it's utilizing essentially a pacemaker-like device, which is an electrical pulse generator. However, of the many things it may be doing, the one thing it's not doing is pacing the stomach or the GI tract. What are potential benefits? Well, similar to what you heard with plication, there's a simplicity and a safety factor to it. And one thing that the almost 12 years of study and probably close to 1,000 patients have demonstrated, no mortalities and extremely few major complications. It doesn't involve stapling. It doesn't involve cutting. It doesn't involve anastomosing. It doesn't rely on the traditional mechanisms of restriction and malabsorption. It seems to be more related to vagal or hormonal changes. It is very safe. There are a few long-term sequelae. Patients don't feel anything when these devices are activated, although very few do, if any. It doesn't seem to change digestion much. And what all of these different technologies have in common is the creation of early satiety. Patients really like the concept because they're not put on those draconian post-operative diets that we all do, stage one, stage two, stage three. You can't eat this, you must eat that, you have to chew well, little pieces. They can eat normally and generally what those who respond to the technology just eat less. So what's the difference between stimulation versus blocking? Well, when you stimulate the nerve, it's sending signals out from the point of stimulation, both anti-grade down the normal direction of the nerve, but also retrograde back towards the other direction. And it tends to be low frequency. When you block, you use a higher level of energy at a higher frequency, and you're interrupting communication up and down the nerve, both retrograde and anti-grade communication. Well, let's talk about the earliest system, which was gastrointestinal stimulation. And that is more uh, diverse than blocking. Blocking is like shutting the light switch off. Either the light is on or it's off. When it's off, it's off. It's not a little off, it is off. But stimulation can be done many different ways. It can be weak stimulation, it could be strong stimulation, it could be in the middle. It could be continuous stimulation, it could be intermittent, it could be meal activated stimulation. And there's almost uh, an infinite number of patterns that could be programmed into this the device for whatever you're hoping to get. The very first system that was investigated was the implantable gastric stimulator, or IGS. And this was a 24-hour continuous patterned response so that the device was active day and night, but that it fired for a few milliseconds and it rested for a few milliseconds and it fired and it rested with a set amplitude and voltage. And over 800 patients have been implanted worldwide in the approximately 15 years it's been around. There have been a number of small open label trials and also a couple of large multi-center randomized control trials. And the bottom line is, is that there were no serious complications, no deaths, but the therapy was only effective in some patients. And we had seen some patients lose 50, 60, 100% of their excess body weight and we'd seen many other patients with absolutely no response whatsoever. For those that did respond, if you took all the responders together, it was about a 35% excess weight loss. And what was also interesting in the technology was the weight loss was maintained. As long as the battery was functioning, the weight loss continued. Patients did not start to gain weight back. 
But however, like I started out by saying, there were a large number of non-responders, and in the randomized controlled trials, there turned out to be no statistical difference between the two groups. And this is the original study that got neuromodulation off the ground by an Italian surgeon, Valerio Shigaina, who implanted 10 patients, saw about a 25% excess weight loss, used a generation where the batteries lasted about a year. When the batteries started to uh, rep uh, replete, he noticed that they would gain weight, and then when he replaced the battery, he was able to maintain the weight loss. And this sort of kicked off the excitement about this, the potential of this technology. And one of the mechanisms of action that we believe plays into this, and this was also validated by later studies with a different device, is that the d stimulator augments the fundic distension and dilatation that we see after eating a meal, which signals to the brain satiety. And when the IGS is stimulated, the volume of the stomach increases. And then when the meal increases it, it's an augmented response. And that was believed to be the potential of how this worked, or at least one of the mechanisms. Well, I just want to very quickly mention a few of the trials that have been on. There were a few fe fe uh, feasibility trials that were done in Europe that demonstrated decent results that led to a randomized prospective double-blind trial in the United States in one center outside the United States that was called the Owen trial. And this trial t turned out to be a complete uh, failure in that a number of the leads or the wires that were implanted in the wall of the stomach popped out during the trial, making the results uninterpretable. A follow-up trial called Digest was done at two centers, a, a hospital in Louisiana and Tufts Medical Center, which was open label but with better fixation of the leads and had better results, where a third of patients lost over 20% of their excess body weight and three quarters of patients lost weight. So that trial added optimism that this technology may be viable. However, in a follow-up, large, randomized, placebo-controlled, multi-center trial, the results demonstrated essentially a failed trial, that there was no difference between the two groups when you put the average together of the weight loss for the entire 190 patients. However, in post hoc analysis, there were some findings that were at least optimistic that there were significantly more patients who lost weight in the study group and lost greater amounts of weight than in the control group. We also had some of the uh, batteries exhaust prematurely in the uh, study group. Now the technology sort of got back burnered after this trial, but was reincarnated in the form of a meal activated stimulator by an Israeli company called Medicure, where there are sensing leads placed in the fundus, remember we talked about the fundic distension with eating, and then uh, e effector leads placed in the antrum for retrograde stimulation. The device would lay dormant until mealtime. The patient would eat, fundus would expand, that would activate the leads, and then they would activate the system. And they demonstrated very modest weight loss in, in a number of small uh, open-label trials, but interestingly, they did demonstrate significant improvements in uh, hemoglobin A1Cs, and in liver functions tests and triglycerides. And this work with this particular technology is still ongoing outside the US. And another company that's jumped into the realm is the uh, Intrapace people with a system called Ability. And this too is a meal activated device that has both sensor and effector leads. And here are some of their early data. There were 34 patients implanted they achieved about a 30% excess weight loss, and this is now out to 23 months, their most recent data on this trial. Additionally, they were able to demonstrate some improvements in blood pressure and in uh, blood sugars. And this, again, is ongoing work. This uh, will be published at some point by Dr. Horbach, who's a professor in Germany. So now let's go on the other side, which is the vagal blocker. And this is sort of the yin to the yang, the placement of electrodes on the vagal trunks at the gastroesophageal junction at a high enough frequency, frequency to shut down all activity of the vagus nerves. And it behaves like a reversible vagotomy. Now you have to go back in the history of bariatric surgery and look up some articles by Dr. John Crowell out of Brooklyn, because over 20 years ago, Crowell wrote two very interesting articles. 
The first article, he severed the vagus nerve at the G-junction of a couple of overweight women and demonstrated that there was significant weight loss. His follow-up article was the addition of a truncal vagotomy to vertical banded gastroplasty, which is just old-fashioned stomach stapling, and demonstrated that there was double the weight loss. In addition, he followed those patients out over 20 years and still demonstrated that many of them had maintained that improved weight loss. That led to the idea that maybe there was something to vagotomy as an adjunct to a bariatric operation or even as a standalone for weight loss. Now, what about the vagus nerve? We all remember from medical school, it's the 10th cranial nerve. It's the longest nerve in the body. There's a left and a, a, a right nerve. So there's two main nerves that come down along the G-junction. And they're the neuroanatomic link between the GI tract and the brain, or the message center to the brain. And most of the fibers are sensory. So there's the vagus nerves coming down from the brain, running along the esophagus, innervating the GI tract. And overwhelmingly, the role of the vagus is to send information to the brain, not from the brain down to the GI tract, basically telling the brain of the nutritional status, what's going on. Has the person eaten? Have they not eaten? The vagus nerve has a number of functions, but we're going to uh, just hone in on hunger, satiety, weight regulation, and food digestion. The vagus nerve is part of the system that gives us a sensation of hunger, of fullness, of satisfaction. It re the relaxation of the stomach with food, like we talked about before, with the fundus distending after eating, is a vagal response. And it also is involved with pancreatic secretions. With the rationale behind vagal blocking is to inhibit the gastric accommodation, not, in, not allowing the stomach to d distend the way it does, inhibiting contraction and maybe reducing some of the pancreatic outputs. And these points have all been validated in animal models. Now, if you perform a truncal vagotomy, it isn't all a rosy picture about weight loss. And many bariatric surgeons learned that doing a vagotomy when they did a gastric bypass added nothing to the operation. Why may, not, why may that be? Well, this study demonstrated in animals a benefit to vagotomy, but a diminution of that benefit with time. And here's the data. In the truncal vagotomy studies, the uh, distension of the stomach was dramatically greater than the sham group, but at four weeks, that benefit was lost. What's happening? Is it compensatory mechanisms overriding the effect of vagotomy? Therefore, permanent vagotomy may not be the solution. What about a reversible vagotomy? And that's the uh, benefits that we think we can achieve with an implantable device that when on shuts off the vagus nerve, but then overnight the device is dormant, the vagus nerve recovers. And the V-block device, looked at by a company called Enerometics, has now been under a study for several years, multiple studies, as you can see, the efficacy of the weight loss improves as the studies go on, as more is learned about it. And the most recent study demonstrated just about a 25% excess weight loss. This is a small uh, study that was done in a group of diabetic patients called the ENABLE trial. The device was on 14 of the 24 hours a day, off for 10 hours, and there was a near 30% excess weight loss in that small series. What was also demonstrated was a dramatic improvement in hemoglobin A1C and in systolic and diastolic blood pressures in uh, hypertensive patients. And this is one week, four weeks, and then this is 30 months out. And you can see dramatic improvements in both fasting blood sugar but also hemoglobin A1C. And there doesn't seem to be a direct correlation with weight loss. The benefits to both diabetes and to hypertension occur right away. They may be separate vagal effects. This was a small sub-study that was done with uh, one of the groups of patients that looked at eating habits and found that there was a proportional decrease in protein, carbohydrate, and fat intake of about 30% each, suggesting that patients were eating their same diets but less, that they were having true satiety. Now, a large trial was done in the U.S. a couple years ago called EMPOWER, another randomized prospective trial, over 300 subjects, and this trial demonstrated no significant difference between the treated and the control group, looking like the IGS trials I showed you earlier. However, there may have been compelling variables here. Number one, it was noticed that for all comers, 
even the control group, the longer they wore the device, the better the results. Those that wore it less than six hours had minimal response. Those that wore it greater than 12 hours lost over 30% of their excess weight. Puzzling the statisticians is why would that happen in a control group? And what was learned was that the device although inactive, was doing interrogation of itself by sending electrical current up to the electrodes and back down to make sure the device was intact. And in doing so, it was actually causing some vagal blocking. It demonstrated benefits to hypertension and to diabetes like the past. And I'll just finish up, I know my time is short, that we're just concluding now the first year of another randomized prospective trial called V-Block, which used a device that had no leads, so the control group was truly a control group, and the results were a mixed bag. We did not meet the primary endpoint of a 10% difference between active and control, but we did achieve statistically significant difference between the two groups, where the study group lost significantly more weight than the control group. And also, for the high rollers, those patients who lost over 50% of their excess weight, they were 13 times more likely to be in the active group than in the control group. So positive findings, not completely uh, a perfect study, and more work to be done. So in conclusion, there are several different systems of neuromodulation and different stages of investigation that are still out there being looked at. Preliminary studies suggest that the technology can be successful. I think it's still a work in progress. Further evaluation is necessary for us to know what the true potential is. We're not there yet, but I think we are getting closer. Thank you very much. Thanks. So, in the interest of conflict of interest, obviously, if you have devices, you're going to have to mention them by name. Scott, you did a great job at being impartial. Are there any questions about this kind of controversial subject? Uh, my name is Dr. Shaw, and I'm from Lenox Hill Hospital, LIJ system in New York. What do you got to say? Thank you, Alphonse. <laughs> Scott, that was uh, fantastic, and thank you. you. You know more about this than I think anybody else on the planet uh, in terms of where we are. My question is the subset analysis. You know, you mentioned in the, in the early IGS that uh, there were a large number of patients that just didn't respond. And it sounds like you're seeing something similar with the V-block as well, maybe not to the same degree. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that in terms of what percentage of patients are responding to blocking and what percent aren't? Uh, and are there any insights that you've been able to draw from that? Well, with the, uh, the gastric simulator, a minority of patients actually responded, and those that did responded extremely well, which was sort of the, uh, the difficulty we had in interpreting the results. With the V-block device, 50% of the patients achieved the greater than 20% uh, excess weight loss. So there are more responders. Most of the patients did respond. It's the degree of how much they responded that I think we have to investigate further. And uh, there were a number of other factors in the post hoc analysis that I really don't have time to go into that was supportive of a therapeutic effect for the majority of patients, but maybe not in the uh, degree that we were hoping for. The one question, I think you answered it in your talk, is that for the older surgeons here, we did a lot of vagotomies, and not those patients really didn't lose weight. We did them for other diseases than weight loss, obviously. And so you think it's the sort of intermittent on and off that makes a difference? I do. I really do because looking at it, and I, there's a tremendous literature on the vagus nerve if you really go back and review it. And a lot of the studies have suggested that there is a decrease in appetite and some benefit to weight regulation with vagotomy, but I suspect that the body quickly uh, compensates for it. Good. One last question real quick. Um, Peter Goretsky from New York. Do you think that some of the initial good results with lab band could have been attributed to some sort of vagal neuropraxia when you have that band as a modulating that vagus? We don't do vagotomy, but you know, nevertheless, there is some foreign body sitting there, and especially this early um, weight loss that we see in spite of you know, adding the fluid that, that was being observed. Is it any mechanism of that is potentially in a that lab band phenomenon, or you don't think that's part of a deal? 
Sorry. That's a very interesting thought that maybe the vagus nerve being uh, somehow trapped by an inflated band may have the effect of like a permanent vagotomy and maybe an early benefit followed by compensation. Nobody's investigated that and it would be very interesting to look at. Put electrodes on the vagus below a band and see what happens when the band's inflated. At least in the animal model, that'd be great. But in the interest of time, we've got to move on. <laughs>